Well, good morning again. It is good to be with you guys. Have you ever been in a situation where you've had a plan, uh, you've had something in mind of how things, something's going to go down, and then it goes completely the other direction? I feel in my life as though I am prone to this kind of thing. I'm constantly at the center of disasters that come out of things that I had perfectly planned out. Uh, and on one such occasion, uh, I was traveling back to England with my wife. We were going to see my family in England. Uh, and it was one of the first times that we were taking my son back overseas. Now, it's a 10-hour flight. Uh, and if you're a parent, you know that the thought of putting uh, someone younger than two years old in an enclosed space with hundreds of people <laughs> uh, and no way out for 10 hours straight is pretty terrifying. Uh, and I remembered what it was like being on a plane and being the, the grumpy person inside the back who could hear someone with their, their child trying to keep them calm and quiet and how difficult it was to be on a plane with that. And so I wanted to be the guy who had everything together, who had my, my son nice and quiet, nice and calm, and everyone could have a real nice flight. So my wife and I thought about how are we going to get this done. So we thought, well, the best way to get this done is maybe we'll catch a red-eye flight. We'll go uh, on a flight from Chicago in the evening so my son will fall asleep, and then he'll just sleep like an angel the entire flight. Uh, and then we'll get to England, he wakes up, and we'll all feel great. And everyone will be like, wow, you all are such great parents. You're so wonderful. i be like, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, that's not the case. And if you're parents, you know that that's never the case, that your children never do what you want them to do, and things are never as easy as you want them to be. And so we reached the plane, and within minutes we're on the plane, we're, we're patting my son, hoping he'll go down. And unfortunately, his eyes are not closing. Uh, and very quickly, he's becoming more and more energetic, and we're taking off. And he wants to go up and down the aisles and shake everyone's hands. And I'm thinking, oh, no, you've got to calm down. Please come back. Uh, and then he starts crying. He's upset because we're locked in this place. And I don't know what to do. I'm losing it because I do not handle disorganization and, and kind of spontaneity well. I freak out. And so we're constantly trying to come up with ways to try and control the situation. And he didn't actually sleep for the entire 10-hour flight. And so it was a really, really rough flight. And next to us, there was a family with a wonderful little girl who was sleeping perfectly. I'm saying, Jonathan, why can't you do that? And so we get off the, other, off the other side, and Jonathan instantly falls asleep. And I say to God, why? Why could you not make him do this on the plane? He was clearly tired, and we planned out this perfectly so that he could rest. It was what's best for him. Why couldn't he just sleep on the plane? And I tell that story because that story of something not going the way we want it to be is kind of where we find Moses this week. If you've been tracking with us in the last few weeks, we've been following the story of Moses as we pick back up with the story of God. The story of a man uh, who was raised in the palace in Egypt. Someone called by God to be the deliverer of his people who had been for 400 years in slavery and oppression. And after Moses kills one of the Egyptian slave masters for oppressing one of the Hebrew people, he runs out into the desert. And after spending years in the desert, he comes across a burning bush. And out of that burning bush, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob speaks to him and says, I want you to go back, Moses. I want you to go back into the land where my people have been enslaved. And I want you to tell Pharaoh to let them go so that they can come and worship me. And Moses' response to this is, I can't do this. Don't ask me to do this. They will never listen to me. Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. And God says, no, Moses, you are the man that I've chosen for this. And you are going to go and do this. And you're going to show them my miracles. And the people will see that I'm their God, that I am the God who is, and I will call them out of their slavery. And so Moses reluctantly gives in. He gives in because God is, is so almighty and so powerful that how could you refuse this God? And so Moses heads back. And that's why we're picking up this week. Now, I think that the heartbeat of today's story is what happens when Moses meets with the Pharaoh and hears the Pharaoh's response. But before we get there, there's a couple of very strange passages leading up to Moses' arrival back in Egypt that I just really quickly wanted to go over together. Because I think if you have been reading through Exodus and you've been going through these passages, you probably have a little bit of a question mark when you read through them. Now the first of these is in Exodus 4 in verse 21. This is what God says to Moses as he is starting his journey back to Egypt. He says, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart. So that he will not let the people go. Now, there's a bit of a question mark for me there because it, it seems like an odd statement that God is saying, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he won't let them go. There's a question mark because initially I'm thinking, well, that seems a bit kind of counterproductive that he's telling Moses to go back and let these people go, but he's going to harden Pharaoh so that they can't be let free. So, why would God do that? And then the second question mark I have is, is the 
the right thing for God to be hardening someone's heart and preventing them from doing what he wants them to do. It just seems a little sketchy to me. It's difficult for me to understand. And I think, ultimately, there's no explanation that any of us, the greatest scholar in the world, is going to be able to have to read this passage and say, this is exactly what God was doing, and this is why he was doing it. I think the first thing we need to remember if we are going to wrestle with this passage rightly is, first of all, God is free to do as God pleases. That's something that we all have to settle in our hearts. Certainly as Christians, if we want to know God, is that he is able to do as he pleases. He knows more than us. He is kinder than us. He is more loving than us. And so ultimately, we need to trust that when God makes a decision and acts uh, in his best interest, that that is what is best for all of us. Now, alongside of that, in understanding that God is free to do as he pleases, I think what may be helpful in understanding this is that God is not making Pharaoh do anything that Pharaoh does not want to do. When God says that he's hardening his heart, he's not saying, I'm going, he really wants to let the people go and I'm going to prevent him from doing that. What he's saying is that I'm going to confront Pharaoh with his sin. I'm going to reveal myself to Pharaoh. And in that moment, Pharaoh will be hardened as a result of seeing who I am. Now, to maybe explain that in a little bit more detail to you. If I went to my son, and my son really wants to do something in particular, and I say, no, you're not going to get to do it. My son can become very hardened to me. Right? He can become stubborn, he's upset because I'm not giving him what he wants. He gets angry with me. Now, we could say in that situation that my son has hardened himself against me because of what I've said. And in fact, the Bible does say on several occasions that not only did God harden Pharaoh's heart, but Pharaoh hardened his own heart. But what we could also say in that situation is because I, as his father, know exactly how he is going to respond when I confront him with something that he does not want, and I know that he's going to be hardened, I think it would be somewhat fair to say that I have also hardened my son's heart because I know that when I confront him and when I tell him he's not going to get what he wants, then he's not going to like that. Now, Pharaoh was a man who was extremely prideful, extremely prideful. In fact, Pharaoh believed he was a god. In, in the ancient uh, Egyptian way, the pharaohs believed that they were a divine being amongst a pantheon of gods and they believed that they were the evening and the morning star. So to be confronted by a man who says, you need to let the slaves go because they need to come and worship the one true God, to a man who believes that, that's a little bit difficult. That's confronting his pride, confronting his sin, not only of oppressing the people, but of his idolatry and believing that he was a God. And sometimes when God confronts that, we are hardened against him. And God in his grace is actually the only one who can call our heart out of that hardening process. When God confronts us in our sin, we need his grace and his mercy and his love to be able to think through that rightly and actually come to him. And so in this instance, God is simply revealing to Pharaoh his own sin and Pharaoh is being hardened as a result. And God is making sure that events play out exactly how God wants them to play out in order to glorify his name and in order to rescue the Hebrews in the way that he knows is best. Now the second really weird thing that I want to just quickly jump through before we get to today's passage is something else that happened on the journey back in Exodus 4. And in verse 24, this is what happens on the journey back. It says that in a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him, him being Moses, and saw to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. And so he let him alone. Now this is a really weird story and one that I am pretty sure most pastors in this country would not want to talk about because it's a little awkward. Uh, and it's, it's odd for us, firstly, because God is showing up and he wants to kill Moses. That's what's happening in this story. God shows up and he wants to kill Moses. And scholars believe that maybe what happened is Moses got very sick uh, and they realized that God was coming after him. Now, why would God do that? Why would God come after a man uh, who he has sent to rescue the Egyptians? Well, from this little story, we know that Moses' son was not circumcised. And circumcision was a sign of God's covenant. It was a commandment that God gave the Hebrew people that were his people, that their sons should all be circumcised. And so the fact that Moses' son had not been circumcised means that Moses had disobeyed the covenant that God had made with Abraham. He was in sin, he was in disobedience, because he had not done what God had told him to do. And furthermore, some scholars actually believe that this story indicates that even Moses himself, having grown up in Egyptian culture, may not have himself been circumcised. So not only were his children not uh, rightly brought up in the covenant that God had given, but even he himself was willfully and knowingfully not doing something that God had given for him to do. And what happens as a result of his disobedience is someone else, his wife, Zipporah, is obedient to the covenant. She circumcises the children, 
And then she touches Moses with the blood of that circumcision. And God's anger is turned away. Now let me repeat that and see if it sounds familiar to you. Someone has disobeyed what God has told them to do. And so through someone else's obedience and through the shedding of blood, God's anger is turned away from that person who's disobeyed. What does that sound like to you? Does that sound at all familiar? That's exactly what Jesus did for us. And I think we need to remember as we go through all of Exodus and through, in fact, any passage of Scripture, is that this being inspired by God, God is telling a much bigger story than just Moses or the Hebrew slaves or the Egyptians or anything else that's going on. God is telling us his story. He's leaving us signals and hints and shadows of everything that is to come. And this is a reminder for us today that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is not something that was just unique. This is how God relates to us. This is how God rescues us from our disobedience. And so I think as strange as those two passages are, there's things that we need to keep in mind as we travel through them in order to understand maybe why God is doing what he did. But after we make it through that very bizarre journey back to Egypt, we arrive and uh, Moses meets with his brother Aaron, who God has sent to be his assistant, his partner. And they go and meet with the Hebrew slaves and they tell them, God has appeared to me, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said he is going to liberate us. He's going to rescue us from slavery. And the Hebrew people are excited. They're filled with joy and hope for the first time in perhaps 400 years. Finally, the God that they've been calling on for all this time has heard their cries and he's come to rescue them. And so Moses and Aaron leave a meeting where the Hebrew people fall on their knees to worship this God that's come to rescue them. And they head towards Pharaoh with hope and confidence. And they go before Pharaoh and they say, let the Hebrew slaves go that they may go and worship God in the desert. And Pharaoh says, no. I'm not going to let these people go. And in fact, your request of me is so insulting that I'm going to intensify their work. And I'm going to take away from them everything that they need in order to get their jobs done. And so the Hebrew slaves are now being worked twice as hard as they were before. And not only that, they can't even get their work done because they don't have the basic needs to do that. And so the Egyptian slave masters end up beating them and berating them for not obeying Pharaoh, for not getting the job done that they were told to do. And so the Hebrew slaves turn against Moses, the man who had come to rescue them, who God had sent. And now they say, why have you done this? Why did you go to Pharaoh and tell him this? Because now he's working us twice as hard. Things are even worse than they were before you came. And so their hearts are broken because of their slavery, because of the oppression that Pharaoh has put on them. And not only theirs, but Moses' heart is broken. And that's where we pick up in today's passage that Tommy read, where Moses comes before God and he says, why have you done this? Why did you even send me back? Things are twice as bad as they were before. And we see God's reply to him. And I really like this story, and I think it's important for us as we travel through Exodus, because this is a story about the fight of faith. This is a story about what it means to follow God and the battle to be obedient to God in the midst of circumstances that don't go the way that we planned them out. I wish that I could say that the most difficult moment in my life and the the moment where things went off course the most was when I tried to get my toddler on an airplane. What I'm sure you will all agree is we have far more difficult situations that go wrong in our lives than that. And so at the heart of this story is, is the question of what do we do when things don't go the way that they were supposed to go? How do we deal with that? How do we fight this fight of faith? And I think that it begins with a fight of patience. See, the first thing that Moses does is he comes before God and he says, Oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. So Moses cries out, and essentially what Moses is saying is he's saying, Remember at the burning bush when I told you not to send me? I told you not to do this. I told you it would go wrong, God. But still you sent me. Still you pushed me. And see what's happened. You haven't delivered us. In fact, things have gotten worse. Moses is really struggling to hold on to what God has promised him. To hold on and be patient in the face of his circumstances turning very badly. You see, we need to fight for patience to trust God. That's not something that's going to come naturally. We're not going to be able to face the many different things in our life that are going to go wrong. Uh, and have patience if we don't fight for it. We need to understand that sometimes things are going to get worse before they can get better. See, the Bible doesn't pre- present for us a God who's easily or quickly understood. But that doesn't mean that he's not worth trusting in. Thankfully, God's working on our behalf is not dependent on our understanding of him. And so in moments when things go off in the left field, we can still trust him. 
And I think the second most important thing in understanding this fight for patience is we need to understand that obedience to God is not a guarantee that things are going to go right. When we do what God asks us, when we live rightly, that doesn't mean that we're not going to face advers- adversity. I love something that Pastor Brian once said. He said that a God who doesn't have you face any struggle is probably a God of your imagination. A God who loves us and cares for us and wants the best for us isn't going to lay things out easily for us. That's a genie. That's what genies do. That's not what God does. Because God is real and is far better. And if we remember the story that God has been telling us thus far, we can look back into Genesis and see the story of Joseph, a man who was as obedient as any of us could be to God, who was faithful to everything God had called him to do, and things didn't go well for him. He was betrayed and abandoned by his own family. He was falsely accused and he was thrown into prison despite being totally obedient. And now we see the story of of Moses who's trying to be obedient and things likewise are not going the way that he expected them to go. And so we need to understand that following God involves this fight of patience, this fight to trust him in the midst of when things go wrong. Now that isn't to say that we just need to kind of get over the difficulty of our painful circumstances and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and just say, okay, well we just need to be patient. That's not the message. You see, there's more to the fight of faith than just the fight for patience. There's the fight to remember as well. See, God offers Moses comfort. He doesn't just let Moses request this and say, hey Moses, you don't get to question me. I'm God. You don't get to question my faithfulness and my promise. That's probably what I would do, but I'm thankful that God is not me. And it's one of the best things about God is that he's not like me. You see, God offers comfort to Moses. He has something to say. And what he says is, Moses, I need you to remember. I need you to remember who I am. And I need you to remember what I've promised you. See, this is what God says when he speaks back to Moses. He says, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. The best thing that God tells him to remember is who he is. He says, I am the Lord. And I've not revealed myself to these people as the Lord before. Now, it's a little bit lost on us because when we read that in our English translation, we just see the Lord and it's okay. Well, what what does that mean? But if we read this in Hebrew, that, that name the Lord is actually a result of when God met Moses at the burning bush and said, I am that I am. It's a name, Yahweh, that is a name that goes on throughout all of the Old Testament. And when God says, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, I am that I am, he's saying, I am completely eternal, completely self-existent, not dependent on anything. I'm not like all the other gods that need this or that. I simply am. And God distinguishes himself from all the other gods. And we see what that means to be the God who is when we look at the burning bush. Because it's a bush that is burning, but is not burnt up. That's exactly what God is like. He doesn't burn up. He doesn't run dry. He is what he is. And he is for all eternity. He had no beginning and he's not going to have an end. He needs nothing from us in order for him to be who he is. Now that's a really great piece of theology to think about. Well, God is eternal. That's really nice. But how is that in any way comforting to Moses as he's struggling through this painful situation? Well, in some ways, the, the kindest and most comforting thing that God could ever tell you is that he is the God who is, that he is the great I am. Because if God is completely self-sufficient and he doesn't need anything from you and he never runs dry, then you can come to that God and you can ask and speak to him knowing that though you have nothing to offer him, that you can still approach him, that he still has everything you need, that because he does not run dry, you can call on him and know that everything you possibly need will be given to you and it won't run dry. God can be your supply. And that is what God is trying to get across to Moses when he's saying, remember who I am. He's saying, Moses, remember that I'm all you need. I'm everything that the Hebrew people need in this situation. I am your supply. I'm everything and I am and I'm not going to run dry on you. This is something that continues all the way to the New Testament. When Jesus arrives on the scene and begins preaching in his ministry, he uses the phrase, I am, that same way of identifying himself that God does in the Old Testament. And he says this not only to make sure that people understand that Jesus is identifying himself with God, with Yahweh, but he does it to comfort them. For example, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am on several occasions. He says to those who feel in darkness, I am the light. And he says to those who thirst, I am the living water. 
To those who feel lost, he says, I am the way. And to those who are confused, he says, I am the truth. To those who are under the curse of death, he says, I am the life. And to those who feel lost and need guidance, he says, I am the good shepherd. To those who need to meet with God, he says, I am the door. And to those who are crushed by their sin, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. See, when God tells us that he is the great I am, he's trying to comfort us. He's trying to say, I am what you need. Everything that you need can be found in me because I am. And so, as I said, in some ways, this is the most comforting thing he could say to Moses, who feels like he has nothing in this situation. Now, the second thing that God does that is of equal importance is that God reminds Moses of his promise to the people. It reminds him of the covenant that he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, if we remember back to when we were talking about Genesis earlier, uh, in towards the end of the fall and in the spring, we will remember the story of Abraham and how in Genesis 15, God appeared to Abraham and said, I'm going to make a covenant with you to be your God and you and your descendants are going to be my people and I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. And when God makes this covenant with Abraham, he does something very strange. He tells Abraham, I want you to take several different animals and I want you to cut them in two and lay them in two rows. And then after Mo uh, Abraham does that, the presence of God in uh, the appearance of a cloud and a fire passes through those divided animals. And in this culture and in that day and age, what God was saying is, if I don't uphold this covenant, Abraham, then be it done to me as it's been done to these animals. So this covenant that he made with Abraham was extremely serious. And the penalty for not upholding it was death. So God took this covenant extremely seriously. So when God is trying to rem remind Moses of this covenant, he's saying, remember, remember how serious this promise was to me. Remember how I promised you that I would be devoted to it, that I would be committed to it. When I'm trying to understand the covenant, maybe the best example that God has given us to, to understand what it means for God to promise to us, I think of marriage. And one of my favorite authors, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, once said of marriage, that in a marriage, it's not your love for one another that sustains your promise to each other. It's actually your promise to each other that sustains your love for one another. And what he meant by that is that in a marriage, you're going to face difficulty, and there's going to be days when the love ebbs and flows. I've only been married three and a half years, and I already know my wife probably has a difficult time loving me on certain days. But I'm thankful that what keeps us together is not the, the constancy of our love together, but it's the promise that we made. And more than that, it's the promise that God made us in our marriage to be faithful to us. And when I remember that promise, it encourages me to love my wife. When I remember that I had promised and covered in myself to keep her and to care for her and to love her in good days and in bad, that actually helps me to love her better. That helps me to remember how much I loved her in the start and how much I should love her always, how I can serve her. And that's the idea of what a covenant is to God. God makes his promises because... He knows that there are going to be difficult days and we can look back on that promise and find strength in it and remember that he swore to us, he devoted, he committed himself to us, so much so that he was willing to die if that promise was ever broken. But God doesn't just simply end uh, in his comfort to Moses, requesting that he just remember things. It, it would be good if he stopped there and certainly, as I've said, remembering who God is and what he's promised to us is incredibly comforting and it's good for us, it helps us. But God goes one step further. He doesn't just tell him about the fight to be patient and the fight to remember. He tells him about the greatest fight of all in our fight of faith, and that's the fight of the Savior. It's a fight that doesn't even belong to us. See, this is what else God says when he speaks to Moses. He says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give to it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. See, part of God's promise is not that we will need to do something in order to inherit it. That we will need to try and work this horrible situation. That Moses and the Hebrew people somehow need to work out a way to convince Pharaoh. God is saying, no, the promise in this fight is that I will do those things for you. I will get done what needs to be done. 
In chapter 6 alone, God says seven times that he is going to do something. He says in verse 1 of chapter 6, now you'll see what I will do to Pharaoh. And then in verse 6 that we just read, I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. In verse 7, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And then finally in verse 8, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham. God is telling Moses that the greatest fight in your fight of faith is not your fight, Moses. And that's what God's saying to us today, is in our battle of faith, in our struggle when things go off course and things don't go right, the greatest fight that needs to be fought in those moments isn't going to be fought by us. It's going to be fought by God. I really love stories about heroes. I love superhero movies and action movies and adventure movies. Uh, And one movie that came out very recently about a real-life hero is a movie called Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, Now, it's a particularly graphic movie, and some of you may have seen it, and it's about the story of Desmond Doss, uh, a military man in World War II who was a conscientious objector. And he said that he never wanted to carry a weapon, and so he enlisted with the military, not as a soldier, but as a combat medic, because because of his Christian beliefs, he didn't ever want to kill someone. And we have a picture of Desmond here. This is a picture of Desmond receiving the Medal of Honor from President Truman. And Desmond received the Medal of Honor for his actions during a battle on a place called Hacksaw Ridge, which is where the movie gets its title. And this is Hacksaw Ridge here. It is a 400-foot cliff uh, in the Japanese islands. Uh, And on the top of that cliff was uh, a Japanese encampment, was the Japanese forces. And the Americans were challenged to try and advance against the Japanese by climbing Hacksaw Ridge, by climbing this 400-foot cliff. And when they came over the top, they would be met by a barrage of machine gun fire and booby traps set by the Japanese forces. And Hacksaw Ridge was so violent that that's how it actually got its name as Hacksaw Ridge, is because people would literally be cut down because of how unbelievably violent it was over the top of that cliff. And in fact, in this picture, the photographer said, I'm not getting any closer to the cliff because of the machine gun fire that was spraying over the top. And that's Desmond there at the top. Desmond and his soldiers had to hang a cargo net just so that they could climb this cliff because it was so sheer. Now, the really greatest thing about Desmond is that on one such occasion where they were climbing and trying to advance against the Japanese, there was a particularly brutal battle. And most all of uh, the, the group of them went over the top were cut down and were left to die on the top of Hacksaw Ridge. And the American forces had to retreat, but Desmond decided to stay behind by himself. He stayed on top of Hacksaw Ridge where there was machine gun fire. And for the entire night after that battle, he ran backwards and forwards, grabbing whoever he could find who was still alive and slowly pulling them back to the edge of the cliff and then lowering them, lowering them down over this 400 foot drop on ropes. And he went backwards and forwards the entire night and every time he would go, he would pray, Lord, let me get one more. Let me rescue just one more. And over the course of that night, the military and his uh, senior officers believed that Desmond saved 100 men. Now Desmond was very modest and he said, no, I think I actually only saved about 50. Well, big difference, Desmond, that's still a huge amount of men. And so they actually settled in the middle and they said about 75 people were saved. And that's actually why President Truman awarded him the medal. He said for the the rescue of 75 men in the heat of battle on Hacksaw Ridge, you get the Medal of Honor. And he was the first conscientious objector to actually receive that honor. Now I love the story of Desmond Dawson. It's important for us and it's it's something meaningful for us. Not just because it's a really great story of adventure, but because Desmond portrays the type of hero that God is for us. You see, in this situation, Desmond would run into the situation of people who were homeless, hopeless, people who were broken, people who probably didn't have much optimism left for their situation. And he said, I'm going to get you out of here. I'm going to make sure that you make it out of here alive. And he would pull them back one at a time in the midst of their hopelessness. And that's exactly what God does in the story of Exodus. As he comes to a people who were told at the uh, close of chapter 6, would not listen to Moses and would not listen to God because of their broken spirit and because of their harsh slavery. God comes to those broken spirited people and says, I am going to get you out of here. That's what he's instructing Moses to tell them. Don't tell them what they need to do, Moses. Tell them what I'm going to do for them. Remind them of who I am. Remind them of what I promised them and remind them most of all of what I'm going to do in these moments that I'm going to bring them out from the burden of the Egyptians. See, God doesn't expect you to rescue yourself. He doesn't expect you to comfort yourself, and he doesn't expect you to reassure yourself. The God of the Bible is the God who comes to rescue you. 
The God of the Bible is the God who comes to comfort you, and the God of the Bible is the one who comes to reassure you in the midst of your difficulty that he is still there and he is still devoted to you. And the reason why we today can celebrate this more than ever is because for us, God isn't just the God who will. God is the God who has. When we look to the cross, as we will in a couple of weeks at Easter, we remember a very important event for us, an event where Jesus said something very important. In the Gospel of John, in, verse, in chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus says uh, some of his most famous words. He says, it is finished. Right as he dies, he cries out these words from the cross. He says, it is finished. Well, what's been finished? It's the work that God began. It's the work that God began in the Garden of Eden. It's the work that God began with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's the work that God is doing with Moses and the Hebrew people. That's what is finished on the cross. Not just the slavery from the, the liberation of slavery from the Egyptians, but the liberation of slavery to sin and brokenness and all the things that create a barrier between us and God. All the things that enslave us, as Pastor Jeff reminded us of. See, these are the most comforting words in the history of humankind. It is finished because it's a reminder of this God who fights our battles for us. The God who overcomes all the challenges on our behalf. See, God is always faithful to the promises he's made. And he is exactly the hero that he promised Moses that he would be. And he still is for us. When God promised that he would be the God of his people and that they would be his treasured possession, that's what we are today. That's what the disciple Peter says in his letter. He says that we're his treasured possession, a royal priesthood. God has accomplished everything that he promised he would. And he not only brought the Hebrews out of the bed of their pain and their slavery, but he's brought us out of ours. So when we fight our fight of faith, when we remember today the story of the Hebrew slaves and of the difficulty Moses faced when he returned to Egypt, we should remember first and foremost, not our battle, but God's. Not the fight that we need to win, but the fight that God has won on our behalf. And then you will find that fighting for patience and fighting remembrance is far easier because if you start with what you need to do you have missed the most important and most uncom- comforting thing that God wants to teach you and to tell you and that's that he is the one that fights on your behalf see the thing that makes Christianity more beautiful and more wonderful than any other message in the history of humanity is it's the good news of a God who belittles himself and lowers himself in the midst of faithless people and who is faithful on our behalf, who rescues and redeems and restores us. And there's no better place for any sermon in any church across America today than to end than on the note that that's who our God is, the God of the gospel, the God who rescues us. So would you guys pray with me as we close this morning? Father, thank you for the great news, the most beautiful news in all of history, that you are the God who has fought on our behalf. That you are the God that didn't forget the Hebrew slaves in their broken spirit, in their harsh slavery. And you're not the God that forgot us in our broken spirit, in our slavery to sin. But you are the God who did, the God who is, the God who went to the cross and took upon yourself all the penalty and all the difficulty and all the challenge of our battle and won it on our behalf. God, we rejoice and we sing and we worship, not because we have anything to bring to you, but because God... You are beautiful enough to have brought everything for us. Lord, we cherish your name and I pray that we would never forget the good news of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name.